imbecile. Moron. Incompetent. Useless. Idiot. Overbreeder. The words ringing in minority women's ears for decades in America. From the years of 1910 to 1970, over 60,000 people were forcibly sterilized. Over a quarter of these were performed in California alone. A plethora of hatred and fear in white communities was caused by a heavy foundation in nativism, every sector of education supporting eugenics, and a massive Mexican immigration to California. Rampant stereotypes emerged in California, among which was the idea that Mexican women were overbreeders, leading to many cases of forced and coerced sterilization. Then, finally, in 1978, 10 Mexican women and two Mexican lawyers took a stand against years of injustice. The lawsuit Madrigal v. Killigan fought against the unethical sterilization of Latina women by taking a stand for Latina civil rights. Sterilization's final chapter, Madrigal v. Killigan. The word eugenics was coined by Sir Francis Galton, a Victorian scientist and cousin of Darwin, in 1883. Kind of misread Darwin's thought of evolution. Uh, he, he, he said that uh, nature would do this slowly, but by good marriages and by smart people marrying smart people and having smart children, you could wither the lesser quality individuals and bring out the greater quality of individuals. The ideas quickly spread to America through Charles Davenport and were adopted by many birth control advocates, one of the most prominent being Margaret Sanger. From an outsider's perspective, she was a strong supporter of women's rights to birth control and reproductive health care. Yet in reality, her motives partially derived from a desire to reduce the population of minority races. Furthermore, Sanger did not try to hide her views of minorities, in particular Mexicans. In 1932, she said that the United States should keep the doors of immigration closed to the entrance of certain aliens whose condition is known to be more detrimental to the stamina of the race. There were already high tensions at the U.S.-Mexican border, including an instance in 1916 where the Mexican consul complained to their U.S. counterpart about their citizens being stamped with ink upon entering the U.S., to which the U.S. responded that it was for their own good. Around the same time, Margaret Sanger and a fellow colleague, Robert Dickinson, formed the National Committee for Maternal Health. This organization conspired with pharmaceutical companies by testing new and potentially dangerous contraceptive drugs on unconsenting women. Because of this, in Los Angeles, where there were many Mexican women, birth control was viewed as a double-edged sword. On one hand, it liberated women from the roles of caretaker and nurturer, but on the other hand, it crippled many women who became guinea pigs for medical researchers. Just as the medical world was exploring the applications of eugenic ideals, the judicial world was excusing and encouraging it. In 1927, the Supreme Court case Buck v. Bell gave pro-sterilization advocates an ironclad legal argument to defend themselves. Carrie Buck was sterilized because she was classified as a moral delinquent, feeble-minded, a middle-grade moron, and incompetent. In fact, one of the judges vocally agreed with the decision by famously stating, three generations of imbeciles is enough, in reference to Carrie, her mother, and her daughter. It also reinforced the notion that states had the right to sterilize for the benefit of society. However, the justification of eugenics changed dramatically post-World War II. The idea of purifying the American bloodstream was too reminiscent of Hitler's final solution. Therefore, eugenicists evolved to preserve public opinion by transforming their platform. The idea of sterilization became a noble cause for the preservation of the earth and the defense of the rights of unborn children. This shift is best exemplified in The Population Bomb, a book written by Paul R. Ehrlich in 1968. Greatly influencing America's views on society and population control, Ehrlich included doomsday scenarios to shock and awe the reader. His point was that the world was reproducing at an unsustainable rate, primarily the fault of the poor, uneducated, and minority masses. The population bomb caused the explosion of fear-induced racism and frantic sterilizations. This panic carried over into federal legislation as well. Postpartum tubal ligations were financially funded by federal agencies supported by Lyndon B. Johnson. Due to this overwhelming support, hospitals began to meet sterilization quotas, and they would receive grants for the amounts of procedures executed. 
One of these hospitals was County Hospital, located in Los Angeles. In 1973, a health research group report named County Hospital as one of the worst offenders of sterilization abuse. Surrounded by minority communities and the only public hospital for miles, Latina women would travel for hours by bus, in labor, just for medical care. What was basically happening was when women were in the throes of labor pains and, you know, and under tremendous distress, they would be sort of bullied into signing something because otherwise it would it would slow down the uh, getting into the delivery room and actually deliver. Unknown to countless women, they had just signed away one of their most precious rights, having children. In May of 1978, 10 low-income Spanish-speaking women sued County Hospital for non-consensual sterilizations. They were represented by two young Chicano lawyers, Antonia Hernandez and Charles Nebere. All of the plaintiffs had been coerced into postpartum tubal ligations immediately after C-section births. Doctors purposefully gave the women false information after many hours of labor to coerce them into sterilization. Rebecca Figueroa was told the procedure was reversible. The trial was two and a half weeks long, and it was riddled with overt bias towards the defendants. In fact, Judge Jesse Curtis was a supporter of eugenics. He ruled against the plaintiffs, saying that the doctors had good intentions and meant no harm. Curtis excused the doctors' motives of stopping an overpopulation problem and indirectly blamed the plaintiffs' Mexican culture for their anger about the sterilizations. Although the plaintiffs lost the case, they won the public's support. Every woman, as soon as she heard about it, was just ready to do anything, right? I mean, it was so outrageous. The charge for change was rampant, and Madrigal v. Killigan captivated the attentions of activists all around the country. Due to media coverage and societal outrage, County Hospital was forced to comply with federal sterilization guidelines, as well as having consent forms be bilingual. Art Torres, a California State Assembly member, wrote a letter to Governor Edmund G. Brown after finding out about Madrigal v. Killigan, asking to repeal the sterilization law, and it was finally repealed in 1979. In March 2003, Governor Gray Davis apologized for the sterilization program in California. Speaking for the people of California, he conveyed his message to the victims and their families of this past injustice, lamenting, Our hearts are heavy for the pain caused by eugenics. It was a sad and regrettable chapter, one that must never be repeated. The timing of the case perfectly aligned with the back end of the civil rights movement in the anti-war movement and the beginning of the Chicano movement. Primarily educated young men and women were a part of the movement, fighting for racial equality. Similar to the civil rights movement, they protested passionately and raised much awareness for issues that the Latino community faced. Street protests combated a eugenic nation built on double standards and oppression of Latino women. The Madrigal v. Killigan verdict supported all of what these young activists were saying, and finally the white community began to notice. Newfound government and academic interest in minority groups led to more and more studies about the challenges that Mexican Americans faced, helping to eliminate some of the nationwide ignorance towards Latina struggles. Although Madrigal v. Killigan inspired many changes in American legislatures and society regarding sterilization and Mexican acceptance, America still has an uphill battle in terms of good relationships with the country of Mexico and its people. Despite this, coerced sterilization has stopped almost entirely in the U.S. One can speculate that if not for Madrigal v. Killigan, the issue of coerced sterilization would have gone on for much longer, especially for Latino women. No other lawsuit had brought to light the systemic problems of forced sterilizations. Contrary to society's thoughts of Latino women being incompetent and useless, they sparked a nationwide change. With the plaintiff's bravery, they took a stand against injustice so that future generations would live in a fairer world. They fought so that doctors would be held not just to legal standards, but also to ethical ones. Following the verdict of Madrigal v. Killigan, Public outrage finally ended the chapter of forced sterilizations in America and paved the way for better treatment of minorities in all aspects of life. Music